much, um, Dr. Craig Simmons, and thank you to the organizers for allowing me to speak today. I'm going to give an overview of heart regeneration and where we stand in, in terms of making this a reality someday. <clears throat> and I'll show you a little bit of our work, but really this is the work of many laboratories throughout the world. Um, and these are my disclosures. There are really two major opportunities in heart regeneration for adults. One of them is <clears throat> early on, right at the time of an infarction and trying to prevent some of the damage that still occurs in patients who present too late. Um, and the other one is late cardiomyopathy or systolic ischemic cardiomyopathy or other cardiomyopathies where the damage has been done, but we would like to actually uh, replenish the cellular supply of the heart. And these are different, but they both have their challenges. It's worth just summarizing what's gone on for the past 20 years or so in this area. There have been many, many discoveries and many clinical trials. Um, and by and large, those clinical trials have been unsuccessful and disappointing. And I won't go through each of them, um, except to say that many of them were based on science that was not that strong. Um, there was a lot of excitement about heart regeneration <clears throat> and its potential, but um, we didn't really have a fundamental understanding and certainly not the fundamental understanding that we have now. And this is just one of those studies that appeared with a great deal of fanfare in 2011, when it appeared that stem cells could reverse heart damage. Um, this was from the CNN website. Uh, and there were many papers like this where, where it suggested that we could inject some form of stem cells and that they would replenish the heart. Um, but we know that the science behind those studies was incorrect. And at this point, there is overwhelming evidence that there aren't adult stem cells in the heart to any meaningful degree. And so um, it really isn't a surprise that those studies were not successful. <clears throat> now, one of the major things that we have learned is that the heart can regenerate itself under certain conditions, such as in the first day of life. And this is a study from um, <clears throat> Hesham Sadek and Eric Olson's laboratories in Texas. Um, where they described that on the first day of birth, a mouse could actually replenish their myocytes and regenerate the apex of the heart after having it resected. And this ability seems to be not from stem cells in the heart, but from um, cardiomyocytes that were pre-existing in the heart <clears throat> that then led to um, replenishment of the supply of the damaged heart. So we understand now that in the adult heart, there's scarring after an injury uh, um, and that we don't get this myocyte proliferative response. But in the embryo or in the neonatal mouse, one can replenish heart cells uh, readily um, through cardiomyocyte division. Again, this is not a stem cell driven event. <clears throat> we also now have multiple animal models uh, to study, including zebrafish, um, including axolotls, which is a type of salamanders. These can, as adults, regenerate their hearts to couple with neonatal mice. And we're beginning to learn a great deal about the things that these have in common. And one of the major things that we're learning over and over again is that myocyte division is a key step to regenerating the heart. This is a study uh, in zebrafish where they cut off the apex of the heart and they labeled the uh, cardiomyocytes with this green fluorescent protein. And then after the injury was repaired, you can see that those cells that were uh, labeled green before um, had replenished the apex. And so this is consistent with overwhelming evidence at this point that unlike the bone marrow where there are adult stem cells that are um, keeping our bone marrow <coughs> functioning, the heart works by replenishing its myocytes with myocytes, and that has been a uni uniform finding throughout the world. That's led to a great deal of understanding and interest in making myocytes divide, as you can expect. And um, we do understand those pathways quite well. We know that this can be done with growth factors, and 
a, a variety of approaches that can be done with microRNAs and uh, that there are controls on the system, including cell cycle controls and the YAP signaling pathway. And so a lot of biologic understanding has gone into how cardiomyocytes divide. But it's not clear that we're going to be able to do this without some hazard. Um, this is a microRNA study that was published by um, Mauro Giacca's group in Italy, and they took a microRNA that could make cardiomyocytes divide and then introduced them into a pig. And what they found is that they could indeed make the heart function better, um, but over time, those pigs would die. Uh, and the cause of death was a tumor, uh, a benign tumor looking structure that caused ventricular tachycardia. And so we know that we can make hearts better by making myocytes divide, but we also know that if we do it indiscriminately, that there are going to be bad effects. That has led to a lot of interest in making cardiomyocytes outside in the laboratory and then giving those potentially to humans. Um, the problem that we face is that adult human cardiomyocytes won't divide, that we can't really manufacture those with great ease. <clears throat> However, this can be done very readily by using embryonic stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells. Protocols to do this are in use in labs throughout the world. They're very effective and one can generate a large number of human cardiomyocytes in just 10 or 11 days in the laboratory. And the idea is that we will then use those to replenish the human heart um, in patients who are having heart failure. And we know that there's a lot of potential that this might actually work. This is from Chuck Murray's studies on primates where he has taken monkeys um, and, um, and they have had myocardial infarctions. But if they receive human cardiomyocytes labeled here in green, then those hearts can function better. The numbers here are very small, um, but um, there is convincing even evidence from small numbers that this is a strategy that can be effective in damaged human hearts. In order to do this, there are some major barriers that um, everyone is facing. Maturation of the cells, which I'll talk about now, uh, getting more cells to engraft, having them evade the immune system, and then scaling this all up um, in the same way that we're trying to learn how to scale up the COVID vaccines. That's not, not always a trivial thing. Um, maturation seems to be an important problem because most cardiomyocytes you make in the laboratory are immature. They're somewhat like fetal cells or newborn cells. And the problem that we're facing is when those cells are implanted into an adult heart is that they seem to cause ventricular tachycardia because um, they're inadequately mature. And so studies in both pigs and monkeys have shown that human cardiomyocytes will cause ventricular arrhythmias in the early period after transplantation. This tends to settle out over time, but it's still potentially life-threatening effect that we would like to get rid of. And so there's broad interest in cardi cardiovascular research to try to, lead, uh, to try to generate mature cardiomyocytes. I'll just tell you a little bit about our efforts in this. Um, uh, we've uh, had the idea that if you take myocytes and put them into a phase that's called quiescence, <clears throat> that they will mature within the quiescence phase. And the idea behind that is that when your fetus is developing, <clears throat> the heart cells are going through the cell cycle repetitively. But after birth, your cells settle down into this quiescent state where they're capable of dividing but they don't, they spend the vast majority of their life in this quiescent, sleepy, sleepy type of state. And um, our idea has been that if you can actually put the cells into the sleepy state, that they will um, likely mature. Um, one of the ways to do this is by manipulation of a nutrient signaling system called the mTOR signaling system. This is a well-known system that uh, regulates growth versus uh, the quiescent state. Um, and we can turn this off easily using small molecules, including the one that I'll describe here, Torin-1. 
So that is said, Turin 1 essentially puts the cells to sleep and allows them to enter a maturation phase. Um, here's just a little bit of data on that. <clears throat> We're trying to push the cells into G0, and this is flow cytometry showing that we can take human cardiomyocytes and push them over into um, the quiescent state. Um, and then the cells do seem to mature. So these are measurements of contractility that we've made together with Kit Parker, whose lab um, is just down the street from, from us at Harvard. And you can see that <clears throat> by putting the cells into this quiescent state, um, they beat better on these thin films and also they make more of the contractile proteins. They also do a number of other um, <clears throat> uh, phenotypes that are more reflective of mature myocytes. So we think that this problem actually can be conquered probably in the very near future. But there are other problems. Um, one is evading the immune system. <clears throat> you wanna use as, as little immunosuppression as you can, and it's just too cost prohibitive to make a cell line from each patient for, for every single disease heart. So the idea is to try to make off the shelf <laughs> systems and there's several ways to approach this that are being tried throughout the world. One of them is to make many, many different types of lines like is being done in Japan. That's difficult for a place like the United States because of all the different, um, <clears throat> the differences we have in our population. Another is to remove the HLA groups and to make universal donor cells that we can use off the shelf for any patient. And um, another is to try to protect the cells to use a local sort of scheme to try to encapsulate the cells. <clears throat> um, these are all being worked on uh, currently. So um, we have these major opportunities of trying to <clears throat> um, repair the heart in the early phases of damage. But the big problem is taking patients who've already had the damage and coming back and um, trying to remuscularize those hearts in a functional way that doesn't actually cause arrhythmia. That's a big challenge, but it's something that looks like it may be feasible um, if we keep working. So I just wanna finish by thanking members of my laboratory <coughs> um, and our collaborators, including Doug Melton uh, <coughs> and Kit Parker and I will be happy to take any questions.